Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Glass Onion, the second Knives Out Who Done It from director Ryan Johnson. I really enjoyed this film, it's Mr. X, the way the mystery was structured, and that rascal Ryan Johnson hid a ton of secrets in the visuals and the production design, Easter eggs that make re-watching this movie super rewarding, so let's break down what you missed. We open with each of Miles Braun's disruptors receiving their invitation boxes, including Governor Claire, she's always in beige, with super self-conscious performative masking habits during this COVID era story set in May 2020. Now while you can see parallels between Claire and politicians like Amy Klobuchar or Gretchen Whitmer, her campaign sign in her office does list her as an independent, so she's probably more of a Kristen Cinema. During her interview with Jake Tapper, the ticker reads Alpha Industries hires new CFO following messy lawsuit, referring to Andy's falling out with Miles. Now Miles Braun is an analog for eccentric tech billionaires like Elon Musk, but Ryan Johnson did write this movie back in spring 2020. It wasn't really intended to be an Elon Musk hit job, but you know, the fact that many are seeing it that way does tell you something. I'll let you fill in what that something is. Lionel runs Miles' company, having to interpret his cryptic faxes. Notice Lionel's fax machine has been decorated with devil horns, teeth, and angry eyes, showing how he is bitterly beholden to Miles' insanity. Duke's mom has already opened this box, seeing it immediately as a magic eye style stereogram. Her bored puzzle solving throughout the sequence shows how Miles' games are actually not that smart to a normal person. As in the first Knives Out, the answer is always in plain sight if you just reorient your perception. The chessboard game is actually set up for a fool's mate maneuver. This is actually the quickest possible checkmate in chess. You can do it in only two moves, but it can only really be done if your opponent is stupid enough to not really know how chess works. Yo-Yo Ma cameos. So a fugue is a beautiful musical puzzle based on just one tune. When you layer this tune on top of itself, it starts to change and turns into a beautiful new structure. This can't Shazam, it's a lamp. This actually parallels the film's overall structure. It presents itself as one movie and then doubles back to layer on top of itself to turn into a more complex story. This box also includes a Fibonacci sequence with the golden ratio of rectangles, framed art that Miles has over his desk in the Glass Onion, which is where he hides Andy's red envelope. Now, Miles' invitation reads, Travel details to come, please forward any dietary restrictions. Dietary restrictions. Duke is allergic to pineapple, something he would have sent along to Miles. And since the island staff is gone, Miles is having to do all the cooking and bartending himself. This is how he knew how to poison Duke. Benoit Blanc plays Among Us with the Zoom group. His avatar is colored white, as in Blanc means white. The black one is M. She Solved. That's Angela Lansbury's avatar, who of course played the famous sleuther in Murder, She Wrote. Stephen Sondheim cameos. His avatar is Fleet Street, a nod to his musical Sweeney Todd, in which Angela Lansbury where he originated the role of Nelly. Stephen Sondheim also wrote the 1973 murder mystery film The Last of Sheila, which Johnson paid homage to with this opening doc scene. Sondheim was actually known to host murder mystery parties, and this movie was among he and Lansbury's final film appearances. The character Benoit Blanc is a huge Stephen Sondheim fan. Remember in Knives Out, he was rocking out to Sondheim's music from Follies. Sometimes I stand in the middle of the floor. Natasha Leone cameos. Her avatar is Big Red. She's actually going to appear in Ryan Johnson's mystery comedy series Poker Face in 2023. And then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a huge fan of mysteries. This guy actually wrote several books about Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock Holmes' brother. But the game of Among Us confuses Benoit Blanc because he is not good at being an imposter at playing these simple kind of party games, which parallels his role in this movie's plot. He knows he's going to be spotted immediately as an outsider and as an imposter, so he enlists Helen so that they can take the spotlight off of each other. Now on the dock, each character's mask reflects their personality. Benoit's mask is a dapper cloth mask that matches his outfit. Claire's mask is beige. Lionel, who's the scientist of the group wears a medically safe M95. Birdie wears a useless mesh mask, just like the one Lana Del Rey got into trouble for wearing. Now, Ryan Johnson broke down this scene for Vanity Fair, and he said that he shot each arrival to intercut with Benoit's reaction, because Knives Out, he said, was shot from Anna de Armas' perspective. Glass Onion is shown through Benoit's eyes. He is really the focal character of it, which is why it takes him and us so long to see that Miles is an idiot. But notice here, in the shot where Birdie struts forward, that dock, according to Ryan Johnson, was too bumpy for a dolly track, so they had to use a jib arm to keep her centered with all the diagonals of the shot pointed at her so that when we cut to Benoit in the reaction shot, his face is in the same part of frame where we were just looking at Birdie from the shot before. There's also some great physical work from Katherine Hahn here. Did you solve the murder of, oh, what's her name? That, um, the, the belly dancer with the thing and the thing. That's you? It is, in the flesh. Oh. I'm obviously familiar with you all as well. Governor, 
ticked off to Tucson. Yeah, the moment Benoit calls her governor, Claire becomes self-conscious and adjusts her mask back up to the correct position. Now, throughout the scene, Bertie's massive hat blocks most of the dock behind her, but Duke and Whiskey roll up, initially blocked by Nikos's cart. This is actually a recurring visual motif used by Johnson, like with Bertie's huge hat blocking Helen's arrival at the pool scene later, or when they all scramble around the house and the lighthouse light is going through it, and Helen is in the foreground closest to us. Things are always right there in frame. They just tend to be obscured by someone or something standing in the way. And little detail here. As they ask why Benoit is there, the assistant Peg is in the distant background doing leg stretches. She is always forgotten in the background, but gives this scene great visual depth. There's always something funny happening in the background of this movie. It's because the cast is so great. Ethan Hawke even makes a quick cameo as the efficient man who gets them all with a throat injection. Apparently Ethan Hawke was shooting scenes for Marvel's Moon Knight over in Hungary and took a quick day flight to Greece. Of all of them, Benoit seems most comfortable with throat injection, I think because he already torched that throat with cigars. Now on the boat, Helen stands beside some deck chairs with an Omega symbol. Really this is the glass onion symbol, it's also on Claire's bathrobe later. But the fact that it looks kind of like an Omega does end up being a clue pointing to Helen as the future end to Miles Alpha organization, Alpha and the Omega. Actually, later there's a close-up of Benoit's watch showing it is an Omega Seamaster, the same watch that Daniel Craig promoted throughout his 007 run. But when Helen walks up off the dock, Miles' jaw drops. He is seeing a ghost. Edward Norton is so great in this movie. In this scene, he's playing it both ways. Both the shock of seeing a spurned business partner, which is what we think is the case in this opening act, but when we revisit the scene, it also works as a guy seeing a woman he thought he had killed. Andy, you're here. Actually, the way he touches her shoulder later, it's like he's trying to put his hand through a ghost. I really am glad you're here. Miles uses the first of many of fake words and malapropisms and back dares. Can we just take a second and fully abbreviate this moment together? Inbreviate. You can actually see Benoit registering it behind him. And other than him, only Peg seems to clock it as wrong. Actually, based on her eyeline, she's actually looking over to Benoit in the shot. Like, did you also hear that? We hear the hourly dong of the island. Dong. Oh, what is that? That's the hourly dong. You know, I got Phil Glass to compose that. What? Who's Phil Glass? Okay. The voice of the hourly dong is a cameo by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who makes recurring cameos in Ryan Johnson's movies. Since he teamed up with him in Brick, he knives out, he voiced the character of Detective Hard Rock in the TV show. Miles says, My puzzle guy barely got the five done in time and he apprenticed with Ricky Jay. Huh? Ricky Jay was a Hollywood magician who often cameoed in films and TV shows, but he was also in Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. Super talented, super funny guy. He was actually going to cameo in Knives Out, but he passed away before he could shoot the scene, and Ryan Johnson paid tribute to him with a photo of Ricky Jay on the fridge in one shot. Awesome moment here. By the pool, Duke talks about Miles' car. Remember that night you almost pancaked me with it on the road outside? Right? Anderson Cooper's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Coop's parties are memorable. Ah, Duke was saying the road outside Andy's house, referring to the day Duke saw Miles leave Andy's house and the day that she died, but Miles cuts him off with Anderson Cooper's birthday. And Ryan Johnson swings the camera away from Duke in order to hide his reaction. Now, when Bertie's hat blocks Ellen sitting beside her, you can actually see the moment Helen tosses the voice recorder into her purse. There was this little thing in my hand. Yeah, you can see a shadow moving behind her hat right as she says, little thing in my hand. In fact, that Johnson shot it from this angle is just some really cool attention to detail. He didn't want to lie to us. He wanted astute observers of this movie to have all the clues they needed to figure it out halfway through. Now, I have a busy schedule and it only gets busier this time of year. It feels like there's always a holiday party or holiday drinks or like a holiday gift exchange or holiday movie outing or some kind of holiday plan going on right when I'd normally be making myself something to eat. And if you're running low on time to cook and still want delicious meals that you can make at home, you should check out HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes having fresh meals at home stupidly easy to do. HelloFresh has quick and easy options like 20 minute meals and easy cleanup dishes. They taste awesome and are easy to make, so you can spend less time in the kitchen and more time debating the rules of your family's white elephant gift exchange with your siblings. And if you want to bring something with you, you'll find what you need at HelloFresh Market. They've got everything from charcuterie boards to desserts, so you'll never have to be the one showing up empty handed. If you're traveling over the holidays, HelloFresh has plans that work with your schedule. You can change your meal preferences, your delivery day, and address in just a few clicks. So being away from home doesn't mean being out of control of what you eat. I recently made some delicious beef flautas that made me feel like a real professional cook. Cooking some yummy beef flautas today with HelloFresh. I have um, sliced some onions, but I've also uh, thinly, thinly diced and minced, one might say, some onions. Or as um, the people who make this kind of food say, cebollas. I now have my uh, meat cooking. It's got onions some spices in it, some ground beef. It smells so good. Look at me, I'm cooking! Okay, I laid out my flautas. 
Now it's time to me to try to roll these. Wahoo! Flautas, get outers! Thanks, HelloFresh. To get started, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code ROCKSTARS21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com and use the code ROCKSTARS21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Now, Miles says he doesn't have a phone. He only uses fax, which is actually a kind of callback by Ryan Johnson to Knives Out when he said that Apple doesn't allow villainous characters to be seen with their products on screen, which I don't think is true in all movies, by the way, but it is a rule that Ryan Johnson sticks to. In Knives Out, Ransom, Chris Evans' character, uses an Android. And in Glass Onion, Miles does own an iPad, but we never actually see him holding it. He just tosses it to Benoit with the Apple logo clearly visible. And from that point forward, that's when Miles escalates his villainy. Now, of course, Miles has filled his living room with famous paintings, including <laughs> Rothko's number 207, which I love this, Miles stupidly hung upside down because the guy truly doesn't know or really appreciate art. He also has a huge portrait of himself shirtless. This is actually Edward Norton's face placed on Brad Pitt's torso from Fight Club. It's painted in the style of Francis Bacon. And all these various paintings are from completely different eras and styles and genres. Miles clearly just picked them for their monetary value, making this place a tacky, uncomfortable museum like the Hearst Castle and not really a comfortable home. Now, Miles hands each of them cocktail glasses with their names and bodies on them, but poor Peg later has to write her name on a solo cup. Miles talks about the Mona Lisa. You know Da Vinci invented a technique for brushstrokes that leave no lines? That's how you can look straight at her and her expression changes every time. This does call back the portrait of Harlan Thrombey in Knives Out, which changed from frowning at the beginning of the movie to smiling at the end of it. The dining table area is a Greek temple with a mural of, of course, Kanye West as a Roman senator in her toga. Now later, while they sit around getting drunk, Claire gets a call from her husband, but she silences it. This is him probably alerting her about the breaking news of Andy's death. But Duke is constantly checking his phone for its Google alerts. And notice as he hugs Miles, early on in this scene, you can totally see Andy's obituary on his phone screen. But notice Duke hides it once Birdie tries to see the phone. And right after this, Miles goes straight over to the bar and you can actually see him pouring pineapple juice in his cup. And he does indeed hand this glass to Duke as Birdie spins, despite him later saying Duke just accidentally picked up the wrong cup. We saw with our eyes all of this go down in the first act of the movie. You can see clearly through to the center of the glass onion if you actually watch this movie closely. So all those complaining that the first half of this movie lied or deceived us, even though that's totally okay for whodunits to do, I think those critics are really masking other reasons they dislike this movie. The kind of reasons I'm not really that interested in. This movie absolutely absolutely gives us all the pieces to see Miles murder Duke and why he does it long before we get anywhere near the second half. Trust me, it's all in plain sight. But you can actually see the moment in Daniel Craig's face when Benoit figures it out. Is he choking? I think, yeah, I think. Oh no, he's not choking. <laughs> It's really subtle, but you can see Daniel Craig's nostril flare. He is smelling the pineapple juice, and he remembers what Duke said on the dock. Again, a line that we all heard. No pineapple on that, right? Duke don't dance with pineapple. There's no pineapple. There's also a pretty clear red flag that Miles stole Duke's phone. Miles! I'm just gonna silence Duke's phone. We're staying right here in this room. I'm keeping you all in plain sight until that boat arrives. Where's Duke's phone? It just dinged. It's Yes. Must be here. Yeah, I just... yeah, Benoit didn't hear it dinging from the body. He heard it dinging from Miles' back pocket, which was right in front of the body. And when Peg approaches Miles, knows how Miles scampers away so that she won't see it in his pocket or be able to locate where the phone is. He needs to get away from her so he can silence it. And so in the sequence where they're scrambling through the darkness, the hallway painting next to Miles shows four pop icons whose names all rhyme. You got Iggy Pop, Biggie Smalls, Twiggy, and Ziggy Stardust. Iggy Piggy Twiggy Ziggy. It's so stupid. When Benoit runs back into Helen, he does call her by her real name. Helen! <laughs> this is actually the first time we hear the name Helen in this movie. So as Benoit starts to explain to everyone what happened, notice the glass sculpture to the left actually resembles the knife wheel from the Thrombie House and Knives Out. So the midpoint of the movie begins with the same framing as the opening shot of the film, a hand knocking on the door, because this movie is essentially starting over from the beginning. Hugh Grant cameos as Benoit's partner, Philip. He's covered in flour and holding yeast starter, as many during COVID took up bread baking. Helen tries to hire Benoit as, in her words, the world's greatest detective, but he responds, I'm not Batman. Batman's moniker, of course, the world's greatest detective, but listen closely a moment later. No, that's outrageous. I wouldn't. Well, now. Wow, now that. Yes. 
Uh, as Ben Wall starts to form his plan in his head, the score does sample the melody of Danny Elfman's Batman theme. So in the bar flashback, the original Glass Onion, Miles is dressed like Tom Cruise's Alpha Bro motivational speaker for Magnolia, fitting that he would name this company Alpha. Actually, when Miles first sees Andy drawing up her business plan on the cocktail napkin, he lines up what should be an easy corner shot on the pool table, but he totally misses it. Helen draws up a motive and opportunity grid, saying it reminds her of a clue notepad, which Benoit cringes at because he hates overly simple party games. But in this regard, Helen does end up proving better at the clue aspect of the sleuthing process. She snoops from room to room. She learns as much as she can about each person, including whiskey, which is so important because whiskey is the one who tells her that Miles saw her for her birthday, which was two weeks prior, proving that Miles was not in Greece the whole time, showing how he had the opportunity to kill Andy. When Helen and Benoit check into the bathroom, there actually is a Matisse painting there. That is Matisse's Icarus, foreshadowing Miles flying too close to the sun and falling in a heap of flame. But that figure also has a red mark exactly where Miles will shoot Helen. Also, I love this detail even more in this scene. Birdie's magazine cover with the gem on her forehead is reflected in the makeup mirror, clearly seen by Benoit as he's always looking down. It just shows us how Benoit is solving two mysteries at the same time. The actual mystery of who killed Andy and the dumb manufactured mystery game that Miles cooked up with Chili and Flame. In the gym, Serena Williams cameos. She's actually reading Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. This was a book that Benoit referenced in Knives Out. Now, when Helen searches Daryl's room, there's a surfboard with a curved A symbol. This is actually an Easter egg reference to Ryan Johnson's film Brick that was a mystery note with the same symbol in the word midnight, kind of the big MacGuffin of the movie. Turns out it wasn't an A, it was the shape of their meeting spot at a drainage ditch. If you're mad at that being spoiler, the movie came out in 2006. Shut up. Benoit breaks down the underlying assumption that everyone in the room, including the audience, had about Miles, and by just untying this knot, he unlocks the truth for everyone. Miles Braun is an idiot. Yes, like the Emperor has no clothes adage, everything we had been attributing to brilliant conspiracy was actually Miles' incompetency, his desperate treachery, and his stealing other people's ideas. He stole Andy's idea for Alpha and stole the cocktail napkin. He even stole Benoit Blanc's idea of putting the loaded gun on the table and turning off the lights. But Miles burns the original napkin, yet Benoit gives Helen a chunk of the clear that Miles had tossed to him earlier. The same thing, if you remember, that was also within reach of Andy on the conference table when she refused to sign Miles' clear contract. And so Helen, the way she smashed Miles' box in the opening minutes, smashed Smashes up this place, she lights a fire and ignites the clear and then races to open the glass containing the Mona Lisa. Now, as the Mona Lisa burns, the paint actually blisters and flakes off, revealing wood underneath. Because despite the way the Mona Lisa is shown in many TV shows and movies, Leonardo da Vinci didn't actually paint the Mona Lisa on canvas, he painted it on wood. So if it were to burn, it would really just be a layer of paint that blisters and peels off. So burning the Mona Lisa, yikes, a pretty horrible thing to do. It might remind you of a lot of climate activists staging these stunts at museums, seeming to deface paintings, but as one could argue for those protesters, in the context of this story, burning the Mona Lisa is the most heroic thing Helen can do because it's the one guarantee she will have that no one in the world will ever adopt Miles' dangerous alternative fuel. It's not just personal revenge she's after, she really is saving the world. Let me know your thoughts on this movie. How did it compare to Knives Out for you? You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EABoss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye. <laughs>